Hey everyone, today we have a special interview with none other than Mr. Palmer, who will share about his experiences on Canada national team, Canada sevens team, as well as his coaching endeavors and some valuable and awesome stories. Here it is. The ball never got outside the centers. Um, but it was, it was a good experience for me. It was a great tour. And, and all of a sudden, you know, I'd done well. I, I did what I was supposed to do in, in, in a game like that. So um, I, I was then picked up for the Hong Kong Sevens team that went. At that time in Rugby Canada, you played both, right? So first Hong Kong Sevens, which is good because it was a small team. Um, I think there were only nine players that traveled at that time. We did really well. We, uh, I'll say we eliminated Australia. We actually tied them in, in the game and then got advanced ahead of them on the toss of a coin because that's, that's that we were tied on so many different levels. So that was, that was it. So we got promoted to the top round and Australia went to the middle round. Um, and again, uh, I had a really good start. So all of a sudden I'd done well in 15, I'd done well on sevens. work but um for the next 11 12 years i was uh i was in, in the national side um so it was a, it, as I, say, I was probably put into the national side a little bit earlier um i was lucky that i wasn't sort of exposed for for that um i think rugby canada took a bit of a chance in doing that but it worked out well for rugby canada it worked out really well for me um and over the course of the, that time i got you know Two World Cups, some some tours of Australia, New Zealand. Uh, yeah, it was a great experience, and lots of games back and forth with uh, with Canada and the U.S. That was uh, those were usually usually one a year for those. That's awesome! Yeah. Sounds like an amazing journey. Were there any? You obviously mentioned like your progression kind of through the levels of the rep camps and then getting on Canada a little bit earlier than you expected. Were there any really big kind of standout mentors or players that kind of helped you along that journey? Yeah, it was um, Don Spencer who was the coach at UBC. Absolutely. And I, th I think one of the reasons why um, I was promoted maybe a little bit early because was because of Don Spence. Don was a former national team coach. Um, very, very well respected coach. And I, I was playing for him at UBC at the time. And um, he was for me a really, really good coach. He was more of a cerebral coach. He wasn't sort of the rah-rah kind of guy. And I and I kind of liked that. He let players get themselves ready. And um, so so Don was Don was a big factor in there. And then there were a few other players. There was a bunch of guys I played with, sort of BC juniors, who also came in fairly early. Mark Wyatt and I played juniors together. Another fellow, Peter McLean, we played juniors together. And we were all sort of coming onto the scene around the same time. So it wasn't like, you know, I didn't know anybody on uh, on the national team. I had I had those guys who were sort of doing the same thing, you know, trying to make their way into the program at the same mm -hmm. time. Senior players, uh, two guys stand in mind, Robbie Gregg, who was, uh, he was sort of coming out of the national team he was a winger he was an old boy from saints as well and he was really helpful for me. and spence mctavish uh spence was a was a really good mentor and he moved from the wing uh when i got there he moved into the centers and started playing more and more in the centers and he played center in the uh, in the first world cup and a lot of fun to play with both those guys were yeah, i'm sure it sounds like you had some really impactful players so you're here um through kind of your all your time, whether it's at Saints, mm -hmm. BC, or in, through kind of your all your time, whether it's at Saints, mm -hmm. BC, or on the Canada national team, uh, what is one of the most like standout or memorable moments that you'll never forget? The three, again, like grade twelve year, um, we had to, we we we'd beaten Shawnigan before, but um, we'd also lost a game to Brentwood, and so we had to beat Shawnigan at Shawnigan, and uh, and we we did, and I, I can remember that I had a couple of tries, but I could I could just remember the whole atmosphere of that day. That was pretty pretty impactful, and that's going back whatever it was 40, 41 years. In terms of UBC, we had one really really good good year at UBC, where where UBC we beat everybody, we beat every club in Vancouver. The only team we actually lost to that year was the Vancouver Reps. Um, and then we ended up tying the Vancouver reps in the last game for, for what was called the McKechnie Cup. Um, and that was the best 
sort of um, university team I, I, I played on. And again, a few guys from that team went on to play for, for Canada. So that, that season stands out really because, you know, UBC was surging, I was surging, and it was, it, it, it was good. That was just the year before I made Canada. In team, there's, uh, I think our, the first World Cup game we had was in New Zealand against Tonga. And nobody expected much from Canada. Um, and Tonga, I think, was a little underprepared. So they, 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 they came in expecting to be an easier game or whatever. And we blew them out of the water. We, we won by about 20 points, which was kind of unheard of in, in, in 87. I'm really, really strong memories for that. There's a, there's a video of the game somewhere on YouTube now, and I've watched it. I think I watched it for the first time in its entirety over the summer when it was released. And it was neat seeing that again. And again, moments of the game stood out. Um, the last game I played was it was a test match against the United States, and that was down in Colorado. Um, and I just I just remember that because there was a lightning storm coming up. We weren't sure if the game was going to continue or if it was uh, it was going to be suspended because of lightning. But I, I can remember that game as well. And that was it was a really good friend of mine, a guy named Colin McKenzie, who we played with at the club level. And that was Colin's first cap for Canada. He ended up getting about twelve or so caps for Canada. And that was his first. So that, I remember I remember that just. Symmetry of that being his first game and my last. That's awesome. Yeah. Over your time kind of playing on the national circuit, um, which kind of game do you enjoy more, sevens or fifteens? I'll, I'll have to say sevens, though. Um, overall, and and only because of the circumstances at sevens at that time there wasn't the pressure. I think on sevens players as there is now. Sevens was seen as as was a bit more of a fun thing um, mm. or competitive, but it was still fun. The games we had were in, uh, you know, were, were in Hong Kong. That was the, for a while, that was the only big tournament. And then um, Hong Kong sometimes was stretched to two weeks. We do Hong Kong and Sydney. There was one year where we did uh, Canberra, then Fiji, then Hong Kong. Hong Kong was the last stop. But going to Hong Kong, you were the, usually there about 10 days. Um, you would stay in the same hotel as all the teams and and so you get to see these players and there were guys that I would see you know year after year from different teams and eventually you get to know them and I went to that um nine times in the 11 years I was in the, in the program and I I just loved that experience and we did we did really well in Hong Kong um we got to the plate final a couple of times and I was there we got to the the cup semi-final one year uh where we we got through the quarterfinals. We beat Scotland in the quarterfinals, and we played New Zealand in the semifinals. That game didn't end too well for me. I dislocated my elbow, but again, it was just it was a it was a really really neat experience um, playing at that level against you know guys who you would read about week in week out in, in rugby magazines and stuff like that. I'm sure not only just getting to play with some of those guys, but what was kind of like the off field off field experience with um, some of the other teams? You said you're all in the kind of yeah. hotel and stuff. In, 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 in Hong Kong, it was great because you had small teams. When, when I was there, the teams were only nine players. A little bit later on, we moved up to 10 players, which was really, really small roster. And what that meant is sometimes during the tournament, a team would be short. Um, so I remember we, as Canada, one year, we had to borrow a fellow from Bahrain. We borrowed a fellow from Kenya because we were short. <laughs> I got picked up for a team called the... the uh, this could only happen after you were out, so... It, Oh, okay. Yeah. We we lost in our game, and then there was a team called the Penguins, which were a club side from uh, it was like kind of like the Barbarians from um, from England. So I played with them. So you got to know the players pretty well, um, and you all stayed in sort of the player enclosure at the end of the field. And most of the players there were were you know were really friendly. Some guys were were world famous. Like I remember sitting there with. Um, Near a fellow named Serge Blanco. Serge Blanco was a fullback for uh, for France. Um, very, very good player. One of the best of all time. You know, and you're, you're you're chatting away about things with 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 these guys, and they don't know who you are. But it was it was that experience was really neat. And there were at the end of the Hong Kong Sevens, there was always a big banquet, and again, it was in the hotel where we were all staying, and that was that was a, a great deal of fun. There was usually skits performed by various teams and it, it was just it was a really good uh, really good evening in the first world cup we played uh ireland um we played them we, we toured ireland in 86 prior to the world cup sort of a, a sorry they sort of tune us up a little bit 
we had a really good game against Ireland in, in 87. We ended up losing, but we were, we were ahead with about 20 minutes to go. So it was a really strong competitive game. And I think we sort of won Ireland's respect at the time, but we had a, we had a really, really good evening. Um, Cause we, we knew a few of the guys uh, played against them before when we were touring Ireland. And, and again, uh, it was a nice social evening, uh, sitting at tables that were mixed players uh, and mixed by position. So I was sitting next to a guy named Keith, Keith Cross, who I played against. I think I ended up playing Keith uh, three times in my career. Um, and he's from, he was from Northern Ireland, so he knew Belfast. My, my, my mom was born not too far from Belfast. So there was, you know, there was some connections there. So it was just, yeah, mm -hmm. it was a good, good evening, good fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the kind of topic of like sevens, what kind of, what's your kind of perspective on like the way the game is, of sevens has changed so much since kind of when you got used to play it? The, not only competitive, but kind of like market for sevens now too. It's funny, I don't, I don't think the game has changed as much as the 15 aside game. Um, the, the biggest difference in sevens is the fitness of the players now, mm -hmm. right? You've got professional players that are training full time. Um, and that wasn't the case you know, even when I was playing, even at the top level, there was more, the, the players weren't as well trained as they are now. Um, rugby was still amateur, you know, most countries, players were doing what we were doing here in Canada. So you're, you're working in whatever profession you're in, and then you're training whenever you had time to do that. And no matter how committed you are, you cannot be as fit as somebody who is training full time. And so with that, there's more contact in the sevens play now than there was when I was playing, right? Mm -hmm. Because the players are fitter, they can do it more, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, but otherwise, the game the game hasn't. I don't think it's changed that much, right? Mm -hmm. And I think if you if you come down off the professional level, the, the game has changed even less because you don't have those those guys who are very big, very fast, and very fit that you, you see in the professional circuit. Um, I do like the professional circuit, uh, you know, the, the international circuit. It's, uh, I think it's a great way to spread rugby around. You've got it being played in some countries where rugby is very popular, uh, like New Zealand hosts the sevens, South Africa hosts the sevens and stuff. But it's also um, in countries where rugby is a little bit less popular. Hong Kong, for example, still has its sevens and always will have a sevens, but that's not a great, you know, rugby hotbed. It is for the sevens. Um, and you know the Vancouver Sevens we've had for the last, I guess we've had six years now. Um, again, Vancouver is not a hotbed for rugby, but that event I think will help to some extent build the profile of rugby in uh, in Canada, as the as the uh, Vegas Sevens have done in the United States. Or what's kind of the experience for you at the uh, Vancouver Sevens? Obviously as a very established player, not only see the new, is it kind of like a social event for you kind of seeing some of the old players or what's that like? Oh. For the last few years, what we've done is we've um, sat in basically the alumni section. So that's the old um, past, past Canada alumni section. And that's been really good because you get to see people who you haven't seen for a while. Mm -hmm. And I've been, I've been around there actually. So that's, um, that's really fun. And then I, we usually go on the second day of the sevens and spend it up. The school always has that big uh, yeah, um, uh, room that is, that's, that's rented out. And, and that's kind of nice as well. It's a different perspective on the sevens. You're not kind of in the crowd. You get to sit back a little bit, but, but it's a little, uh, a little bit more comfortable yeah. than, uh, than being down close to the field. But I like, I like both. And that's what we've done in the past. So I'd love to hear more about your kind of transition from player, obviously, to coach and how kind of maybe some of your experiences from your playing career uh, shaped the way you coach and kind of where where did you coach and how did it all start when i was at ubc um and that's actually what got me interested in, in teaching at uh, at saints as well so there was a, there was a natural progression there and it was the, it was the coaching that got me to love to love teaching just just coaching students i really enjoyed um and then when i was sort of getting down to the end of my playing career. So this is around 1990. I started doing some rep coaching with another friend of mine. Um, I'd finished at UBC at this time. I was teaching full time. And this fellow was a club mate of mine. And he, I think he'd had one year ahead of me coaching Vancouver juniors. This was an under 17 program. So I just joined him the next year and then took over sort of as head coach the year after. At that time, they had a system of play uh, under, under 17 rugby where 
Vancouver would run a team and we'd run a team with the North Shore and there'd be a couple teams out of the Fraser Valley, a team from Okanagan, a team from South Island, a team from North Island, and maybe a team from Northern BC, um, depending on where you were. And they would either play in the BC Summer Games or you'd play just in a, in a rugby only environment. And that was good because there were lots of other players like me who were getting involved in coaching at that time. So you could bounce ideas. People were sort of, you know, exploring what is like moving from a player to a coach. I was still doing both at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think being a national team player gave me a little bit of respect as a coach that maybe I didn't deserve. It was just sort of assumed at that time. Um, but anyway, we were, we were um, pretty successful and I was still playing when I took over as sort of head of rugby at St. George's. I think that happened in 90, 93. So started coaching at my club as well. I was still playing, so I was player coach at the club. So it was it was a busy time in terms of coaching, um, and I couldn't have done it if I was if I was married at that time. But all I was doing at that time was I was coaching, playing rugby, and and, and teaching. So it was it was kind of all consuming. Spring, the Ravens, the club I played with, we won the club first team championship. So I was a coach of that. Um, St. George's won the high school championship. I was coach of that. And this, the Vancouver team that I was coaching, we also won the, the BC under 17. Wow. We had those, we had those three wins. Um, and it was really good. And I was coaching with different people at the time at the, at the Saints. It was myself and, and Bill, Bill Collins largely. And with my club side, um, it was myself and a fellow named Dave Johnson. And then Dave and I also did the, uh, the Vancouver under 17s at the same time. So it was a, it was a pretty successful time. And coming out of that, mm -hmm. then I was asked to coach Canadian juniors. Dave and I kept, kept coaching the BC juniors. Um, I didn't keep coaching the club because I knew if I stayed coaching the club that eventually I would go, you know, I get called back in to play and I wanted to make sure that I, I didn't. So I stopped coaching at the club. We, with the BC juniors, we, we, we kept winning. Um, we won the Western Canada and then we won um, Canadian championships. And we had, we had a couple of teams that we worked with over that time. And, and there was one team that we worked with as under 17s. We stayed with under 17s as they went to under 18. And then we picked them up again as under 19s and again in under, under 20s. So we coached them like three of those four years. And again, there were about four or five guys that came out of that squad that ended up playing for Canada. Um, they're a really good squad and a lot of fun to coach. So really successful. And that sort of put me on the radar for Rugby Canada. So I was picked up as a Rugby Canada junior coach. And that was in 86. We went to England in the fall. The school was really good because they kind of, they supported me. I missed two weeks of school, but they, they allowed me to do that. 97, mm -hmm. we, we took that, that same team, the Canadian under 17s. We took them to Germany, which was an odd place to tour, but it was a good tour for the guys. We were able to do a lot of coaching. We had a really good team at that time. Uh, we won all our games in Germany. And then the following spring, we took that same team to the, would have been the under 18 world championships. And I wasn't able to travel with them because that was, it was a school rugby season and there was nobody who could, we, 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 did, we needed somebody at school, but they ended up finishing fourth fourth overall at that tournament um really really good finish really really, really good result it's the best result we've ever had at that time then i was also helping with some of the sevens uh, again spence mctowers was coaching sevens at that time doug tate who's the coach at uvic he just stepped down last year he was coaching so i came in to help with run some of the programs um robbie greg who i talked about before he was also uh, a scout for the sevens and he had taken the seventh team overseas so i ended up taking the seventh team down to Mar del Plata in um, Argentina and Punta del Este in Uruguay for a, a two week trip with two sevens tournaments at the end. And again, that went pretty well. We won the plate in one tournament and we were runners up in another tournament in the plate. That time I met my wife and then when we got married, we had kids and I stepped right, right back from, from coaching because it just, it was a you know change in priority. Uh, and I know there are friends uh, who sort of kept coaching through those things. But I just, for me, the priority was, was family. So I stepped, I stepped right back. 
at, at that time. And I haven't been as involved since. I mean, I've continued to coach at the school. And to be honest, that's been, that's been an, enough for me. Um, coaches in junior levels, helping with the seniors. Uh, I can continue to coach the seniors through to about in 2006, um, full time, and then sort of on and off periodically through 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 them. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's it. That's the path. Yeah, it sounds like you definitely you covered so much spectrum. A lot of teams you coached, and my fair part is when you started the coaching like the three teams at once. That was very impressive. It was a little. It was a little hectic. Um, yeah, sure. Basically, what I would do is I'd have one one. <laughs> almost like one coaching plan for the, uh, for the week. And yeah. I would do it, I executed at different levels depending on which team I was coaching. That's awesome. Over yeah. your time kind of coaching, were there any things that stood out as like, you knew this team would find success because it was like some, some kind of like part about either was it culture or was it kind of the boys that you're playing with or was there always, could you tell if you had like a good team based off something? Yeah. And I think it's more just the atmosphere of the team. There's, a, there's sort of a, a a quiet confidence like i referred to that that ubc team in in 83 82 83 nobody would have ever said it but you just sort of went on the field knowing that you were going to you were going to win we were fitter than anybody we were really really fit back then we weren't a huge team but we were really really fast and we knew that if we were if we were a try or two behind at halftime, it didn't really matter because the other team would, they would run out of gas in about 15, 20 minutes. And then we would end up, you know, we'd throw in three or four or five tries at the end of the game because see, we were so much better and faster than they were. So there was a, there was a real, there's really quiet confidence about that. And I would say our team was only about plenty, maybe 19 players deep. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a really, really strong 19 after that, you know, we had to work to cover if there was an injury. Um, so that, that team, I would say, um, it was just that feeling about the team. And then, um, there was a team that we coached, we had at, at Saints, uh, it was in 2004 and they had much the same kind of character, not a huge team, very, very, very fit. And they played at, uh, a level which was higher than any group I'd played with, not just a skill level, but just in terms of fitness and finesse and all that. And they just, they, they basically ran teams off the field. They just overwhelmed them. Um, and that was even like, even going into the BC final, you know, I was sort of thinking to myself, there's no way we can lose this game unless we really lose, unless we self-destruct or blow up or do something, nobody, nobody was close to those guys and i think we ended up winning the final by about, by about 20 points wow they they were a really really impressive team we had uh, good strong players all over the field you know in various positions right like, yeah so that was that was a pretty potent a pretty potent team and then we won it again in uh, in 2005 so we won it back to back and the 2005 team wasn't quite as potent as that team but they just they were harder working. They were a really, really hard, hard team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you say that the hard working kind of aspect and like being able, making sure the whole team's fit is like something that you is a must for at any team that you've coached? Yeah, I, I, I think it is. Particularly at Saint George's, Saint George's, we tend to be a little bit smaller, right? So the guys have to work hard because they they have to work harder for the ball on the field. They have to work harder to retain the ball, um, and it's. And I prefer that sort of fast, open game where you try to run the opposition off the field. I think it's more fun. I think it's more entertaining to watch. And I think it's much more entertaining to, to, to play in. And I think that probably comes from my bias as being, you know, playing on the outside as a wing or, or the occasional fullback. I, I loved that when the ball was flowing and there was room and there was space and you were attacking through multiple phases and all of a sudden holes would open up. And I and I think because I like that so much as a player, I, I, I like that as a, as a coach as well. Do you think that also stems from your sevens background and your I Yeah, I, I would say almost certainly it does, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Elevate to next level, or what's that been like kind of being able to see programs that you've definitely helped along the way change and kind of evolve into something new? Well, I, I think the, the, the school program's a stronger program now than it was 20 years ago, you know, certainly, or certainly 25 years ago. Um, we've had good teams throughout that time, but I think, the 
we have so many good coaches now at the school, right? It, it's, it's, we've got this embarrassment of riches and we've got a variety of coaches, you know, different coaches have different strengths, different focuses. And I, and I, and I think it's, it's really good. So I, th I think the schools progress very well. I think we're better about helping you guys with your training as well, sort of off season training, your strength training, flexibility, nutrition and stuff like that. We're better at supporting you guys than we were. And that's just because, you know, a bigger school and more resources. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we have, um, I don't know if we've pulled ahead from other schools, but certainly we have been really consistent in how we've done that. So we, we produce teams that are close to being as best as they could be. The one thing I find a little disheartening is when I look at some of the other schools, there are some really strong programs that have kind of just sort of disappeared. Um, McGee used to be a really, really good rugby school when they had a fellow named Doug Sturrock. Doug Sturrock, I still believe, is the best high school coach that we've had in BC. Um, and McGee have really dropped off over the last 15 years. You know, they'll have a, the occasional good player, but they don't have the same consistency. That's probably due to the coach, but it's just due to sort of a change in dynamic in Vancouver as a whole, I think, about, about rugby and rugby at the schoolboy level. Point Grey used to have some really good programs, um, and again, they're they've got rugby, but it's it's not the passion it once was at the school. Um, Sammy Amu used to be a really dominant rugby school. Um, there's a fellow down there, down there, Paul Horn. He was Mr. Styles' coach when when he was down there, and he ran a really really good rugby program as well. He was uh, um, he was able to sort of call out guys in the hallways and you know come out to rugby and, and all that and he had a large number of people playing and they produced some really really good teams a couple of bc championship teams over the years and there are a few guys who i coached in bc who'd come from semi amu program and they, again they were really strong and the shame i see in that is that you've got some of these really good programs especially in vancouver but even in the periphery of vancouver that have just sort of disappeared mm -hmm. um and i i i think it's because the coaching has left the school right that's a big big part of it um there doesn't seem to be the same sort of priority and, and so I, for for rugby i worry that um we don't have enough people playing in vancouver we don't have enough people playing in, in high school to support the program um coming into into you know into the senior levels that that we're going to need to if canada's going to keep up with the United States. I always use the United States as sort of a parallel for us because they're sort of comparable experience, comparable teams. Yeah, for sure. On your kind of topic of getting players involved with rugby, is there any kind of message that you tell uh, any any player or any future player possibly wanting to play that would be on the fence about playing rugby? Well, I, I, I think, I mean, the concern people have is just the, the, the physical component to it, right? Everyone thinks, that you have to be you have to be big and i would say at the senior level so if you're looking at the professional level yeah bigger is better right because all those guys are really fit really experienced really skilled bigger is bigger is better but you can still have a lot of fun in in rugby without being enormous and there are still some you know there's there aren't as many but there's still some really really good players who aren't what i would say is enormous you look at um phil mckenzie you know he's not a big person but he, he can play with anybody at, at, at fullback. Um, I've, his name's gone out of my head, uh, but the the scrum half for France this year has mm -hmm. has, you know, he's not a big man either, but he is, you know, he's electric to watch. And there there are there are there are players like that um, who sort of, uh, to me, can 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 stand out as exceptions to being to being big. Um, but I think you can have a lot of fun in rugby without you know if you're not if you're not going to play at the professional level you can still have a lot of fun in rugby and and um travel tour have your club experience uh the way it was and you know for the last for the last hundred years it's still that's still available to people yeah that's very convincing i like your point about you don't have to be big because it's definitely something that i'll take to heart and <laughs> yeah yeah so thank you so much for taking your time out of your day uh to come to this you're very welcome, Sam.